everybody. I wanted to welcome you to our uh, workshop, our parent workshop, uh, Montessori at Home. Um, I hope uh, I hope we can cover everything that you're interested in in today's workshop. Of course, we do these in person. And if you can't make it in person because you have a little person at home or the schedule just doesn't align for you, we also offer this Zoom call, which you're on right now. And if in the future, if you can't make the Zoom call, not to worry, we're going to record this and then we will share the recording for those that can't make the Zoom call. Um, so we've got a lot of options to make these um, workshops and we have several that are coming up. So we do have one that's starting, that that's happening on October uh, 26th and that one is uh, dual language acquisition. And uh, in a future date, we will do positive discipline. So we have a few um, of these workshops that are coming up. And again, we'll provide them in a lot of different ways for to meet you and your needs. So let's go ahead and get started with this um, workshop. Let me share my screen. So Montessori at home. Um, I'm Melissa Rohan, welcome. Just so you know a little bit about me, I have uh, been the president and the founder of Waterfront Academy for over 10 years. Um, I'm a mom of three uh, and they've been raising them, uh, Montessori as well. And, um, and I've been in education for about 15 years. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about um, what we're going to do today. And um, mm -hmm. here we go. Uh, and a little bit about Waterfront Academy as well. So Waterfront Academy is here in Washington, DC. We are a small private Montessori school. Uh, we start at age three and we go all the way through 14, which is through middle school. Um, we are dual language as well, English and Spanish. We bring in a lot of our teachers from uh, South America and other Spanish speaking countries. And, um, and we're also in the Catholic tradition. So I think that's important to know. Um, we, to, in today's meeting, we are, or workshop, we are going to be talking about Montessori um, and the stages of development. Dr. Montessori, she called it um, planes of development, but I wasn't sure if everyone was going to understand that. Um, creating a prepared environment, following the child and observing rather than interfering, fostering independence and freedom within limits. Okay, so there's a lot to cover today. So if you could just um, hold on to your questions to the very end, and then we'll stop the recording, and then you're free to ask all the questions you want. Okay. So let's get uh, into this. And I already did talk about myself a little bit, but you can see in this photo, it's a funny photo of me. Um, I'm actually doing a science experiment with the elementary students. I do, it's one of the things I enjoy is working with the children. Running a school is all fine and dandy, but at the end of the day, that's what fills my, bus my bucket. Um, I, I love working with the children I work with, the, the younger children in the primary classroom, I work with the elementary students, I work with the middle school students. So I work with all the students at some points um, to just to be in the classroom, to relieve my teachers sometimes, um, a lot of different reasons, but, um, but that does happen and I enjoy it a lot. And you can see that in the joy in my face. <laughs> all right. Um, so what is Montessori? Um, Montessori is an educational philosophy developed by Dr. Maria Montessori over a hundred years ago. Um, it emphasizes child-centered learning where children are viewed as naturally curious learners. In Montessori, education is not about memorization or passive learning, but fostering a child's natural desire to explore and understand the world. So some key principles for Montessori would be independence, respect for a child's natural development, hands-on learning, and a focus on fostering love of learning. 
all super important. Um, and so what makes Montessori different? Uh, a lot of things. Our classrooms are multi-age classrooms. So in our primary classroom, we have three, four, and five-year-olds. In our elementary classroom, we start at six and go all the way up through 12. And then in our early adolescence classroom, we go from 12 to 14. So we have these uh, mixed aged environments that focus on individual learning. So each child is on their own path um, and we are there simply as the guide. Uh, we don't lecture the children. We give the children a lot of freedom, uh, those, but that freedom is within limits. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that to choose different activities that run as they, uh, run as, that, uh, that meet their developmental needs, resonate there. That's the word I was looking for. Um, let's move on. So this is, Dr. Montessori called this the planes of environment. And if you've ever seen the diagram, it looks like little peaks and valleys like that. And the idea is, is that when they start here at zero, then they peak at three, and then they come down to six. And then from six, they peak again at nine, and then they come down to 12. And what she noticed, her observation, was that in those six years, the children um, have um, some very similar characteristics. And so she lumped, lumped them, she grouped them together in these different planes. And the peak is when it was the pinnacle of the sensitive period for a particular item or uh, observation. So the first six years, she called that the absorbent mind. And what's really nice is that in the last 15 years, we've had a lot of development in technology where we can actually observe the mind with all of this technology. And what's going on those first six years, even in utero, is that there's all these synapses um, that are connecting in the child's brain at this point. And it's just like, it's like a mess of yarn and it's just, they're all connecting. They're all connecting. And it, that's when the child is just learning everything. I mean, we know this from our own children. When we see them, they're just, they're picking up everything. They're like little sponges. They're absorbent. They're, they absorb language really well. They, abs they absorb, um, uh, different, um, concepts really well. And they just pick it right up. And, um, and so that is what we call the absorbent mind. Uh, and I'll let me give you the, the wording here is when children absorb knowledge effortlessly from their surroundings, the focus is on building order, movement, language, and social skills. Um, and so uh, I think if neuro, uh, neuroscientists would call this like the most elastic time in development, in human development brain elasticity. Uh, the next group is six to 12, the conscious mind. Um, and let me just read what I have here. Children develop reasoning skills, imagination, and moral understanding. They begin to ask big questions about the world and seek more structured, challenging work. So true. Um, in the classroom, what we do, we talk about the biggest thing, the smallest thing, the thing that happened a billion years ago to the thing that might happen tomorrow, you know, whatever in the future, we talk about what could happen in the future. And, um, and so they're just so curious about all of these things. And they get really excited about looking through microscopes at like those atoms, those tiny little things in the electrons that are even tinier than the atoms. And then they get really excited about the universe and how it, expansive it is and how there's multiple universes out there so we go whoosh, big small you know um you know the, the beginning of the earth the dinosaurs you know and we talk about the different eras so they they are so curious they're just getting all the knowledge in their brain and and but it is also the beginning just so you know of the thinning of those synapses that had been created from zero to six, right? Because now they've got knowledge and they're creating knowledge and they're working with that knowledge to a degree. 
Um, so that's what we're seeing with the conscious mind. For the social mind, 12 to 18, this is very similar in a lot of ways to infancy, um, but different, obviously. Um, a child in their, let me read uh, what it says here, and then I can expand on it. Adolescents focus on developing a sense of self, their place in society. This is a stage of personal identity, independence, and social relationships. And all of this is very, very true. So when you look at a, a, a child, let me start with the infant. When you look at an infant, they start out and their whole universe is really just themselves, right? And then and then like a couple days in after they're they're born and they, they can see a little bit further and they see mom, right? So now it's mom and baby. That's the universe. And then it's mom, baby, maybe other siblings, dad, obviously, you know. Now the now the universe is a little bit bigger. It won't even take it. It won't even account for like the grandparents, right? Because they're 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 not you, and they're not they're not in the home all the time. They don't have that kind. They didn't necessarily. This isn't true, maybe for a grandparent that's around a lot, but like a, gr a grandparent that visits, um, they they're not going to have that connection. And then you'll start seeing around the time that your child is becoming potty trained. They, they, if they feel extremely secure with you as the mother or the father, they're going to want to start exploring and you'll start seeing them look at other people, right? And they're going to want to start interacting with other people, maybe wave. Um, and, and they, and so their universe gets a little bit bigger. And so their rings, their social rings get a little bit bigger and they get more independent and they start leaving the leg of mom. And that's around the same time that you want to start potty training when they show that kind of independence that they can leave and start exploring on their own. Um, so that's kind of the same thing when you talk about the adolescent child, right? So they start out and it's very me, 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 me. And, and that is very normal and very appropriate. That brain on that adolescent child is changing. The, the body changing, hormones changing. There is so many things that are changing in that adolescent that they start looking a lot like that, um, that infant, the, the, the first six years of childhood. So they start out and they're like, me, 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 me. And I don't like the way so-and-so treats me. This person is my friend. This person is, you know, and they start doing that. Then they start also very interested in how, because they're, they're also in that transition going into adulthood, right? So they're like, well, how can I affect the world? How, what is my place in the world? And so they start looking at ways that they can be part of the community in, you know, and things like that. So, but when those friend groups start, um, you know, they, they, uh, they kind of test what it means to be a, a, an adult with their friends, right? And so they might do things that are a little mean or they might, and they might, and they will get extremely hurt for those really mean things, right? So th then they're like, okay, well, I can't, I can't be that selfish. I got to like be a little bit more empathetic and right. So, cause that frontal lobe is changing right there. So they, they're, they're learning and they're figuring that out. And that's what's happening in those adolescent years. Now, believe it or not, well, let me read this. Okay. So the adult mind, 18 to 24, young adults prepare for their place in the world, applying the skills and values they've learned in early stages. They seek a balance between autonomy and interdependence. So the adult, the, the adult mind development. So our brains are still developing and it's hard to believe this, but it is true our brains are still developing up until the age of 25. In fact, a lot of boys will get their final growth spurt right before they hit 25. Um, it's not a huge one, but it is, it, you know, it, for, for a guy, it's a big deal. I think for anybody, if we got a growth spurt, it would be a big deal. Um, and, and, and they're making their way. I don't know if you've ever heard of the quarter life crisis. That's the, oh, geez, like I'm an adult now. Hashtag adulting, right? I get so excited about talking through all of these things. I'm so sorry. Um, this is taking a while to get through just the first the first piece here. But, um, but it's really exciting. 
to see um, how the, ch the brain is still developing in those later years. And I think as a parent, we have to remember that they are they are still developing. And so discouraging things that would affect the development of the brain would be an extremely critical thing. So like drugs, marijuana, alcohol, not sleeping, like they need to sleep, um, things that are going to affect those, uh, a lot of uh, trauma, avoiding um, instances of trauma inducing, things like that, uh, that would affect the the brain while it's still developing. You know, I would, you know, I would recommend that a parent be aware of that and discourage those types of activities. Um, so let me move on to the next piece here. All right. So here's a nice little visual of how the child grows, and you can, you know, the, these are just animations here, but um, you can see how. You know, there that would be a representative of a zero to six. They're they're, they're very childlike. You know, even like a three. You know, a toddler. Their head is so big compared to to their body, and so it's kind of a remarkable feat of engineering that they're able to walk when their center of balance isn't where we would normally have our center of balance. And then you've got your your elementary child here who they know it all. <laughs> And, uh, and then we got our, our adolescent and then going into adulthood here. So, but I, I, I thought that would be a fun inclusion. And um, let me move my picture so you can see the words here. Okay. Um, so creating the prepared environment. Now we do that here at the school. Um, we do it very well. Um, we've had a lot of practice, um, but I do think that these are things that you can do at home, okay? And um, so you can create spaces for specifically young children that they can access learning easily. And, you know, is the learning going to look the same at home as it would here? No, and it shouldn't. It really shouldn't. Um, so at home, you know, instead of having a bookshelf, with all the bindings lined up this way, I would get a basket and have the covers uh, facing them. And then having a very specific spot, like if there's a book, you take the book out and then you put it back when you're done. Um, so that would be an example, having chairs and tables that are at their height um, is also really important for them. Um, yeah, parents ask me all the time, well, what about at dinner? Um, should our child be sitting over there? Well, we're sitting over here. No, no. Dinner is a community uh, building event, right? Like you, you, not, you need to do it together. Um, and so having the child at the dinner table with the adults or the older children is super, super important. Just finding a way that the child can sit at the table uh, safely. So whether that be um, a some kind of a, a, a seat that's within the seat or um, those, they, they're like learning towers, but they have adjustable seating. I forget what they're called. Um, these are all ways to bring the child into that community. Um, keeping the space organized and aesthetic, and I kind of talked about that. They need to put everything back where it belongs. Everything has its place. It's very, very clear. So this place is for your stuffed animals. This place is for your Legos. This place is for your um, your cooking uh, materials. I don't know, house playing house materials. So each place has a place for for it. It's got a home, and it's very very clear and evident and organized. And so if, you know, you're just creating the routine. If it comes out, it goes back, and that's it. Um, so let's see. And then uh, providing age appropriate. Yeah. So again, like we, we can see the brain right now. And we know that whenever children or any, any human uses their hands for work, they, it activates more of the brain, right? So 
we if we want children to learn, we want to engage the most of the brain, right? As much of the brain as possible. And um, and so making making sure that things are hands-on now, and there's actually a really great study on this, uh, 2D, 2D versus 3D, right? So everyone's got these screens and they're super in, exciting and interesting and gamified. The learning that happens, there is learning that happens on 2D. It's just not the same learning that happens in 3D. And you, you, you just activate more of the brain and the and the quality of that learning is much deeper and more refined. So having the hands to do the learning is super, super important. And so here's some uh, ideas for you. The, you know, we've got the small chair, the low bookshelves here for their things, uh, the learning tower here to help in the kitchen, wonderful activity for young children. Uh, and giving them an ability to be independent by brushing their own teeth and offering a stool at the sink. Great ideas. Love those. All right. So following the child. This is a really fun one, I think, um, because you get by following the child, you learn your child. It's your child and you get to learn your child. And I always, when I talk to parents, I, I don't assume I know any child better than a parent. Like, I really don't because the parent's going to know. Um, and, uh, and, and, and as a parent, that should empower you. Like, you, you need to really kind of be that person for your child. And, and so what does that mean at home? So I got this really fun story about a child. <laughs> It still cracks me up. Um, and this was uh, eight years ago, I think. Um, obsessed, obsessed with dinosaurs. Everything was dinosaurs. He, you know, and I had a child, my per like my son, my son, obsessed, obsessed with red, red everything. Um, so the, the children will kind of like gravitate on this thing. And so whatever that thing is so this particular child with the dinosaurs fighting him to try and do math or language arts or any you know practical life anything would have been futile until we were like okay he's obsessed with dinosaurs let's get a bunch of dinosaurs so i i went to the store and got like a whole canister of those mini dinosaurs and we had dinosaurs everywhere and that was fine <laughs> It was fun. It was fine. The other children got interested in dinosaurs too. Um, and we knew all the names of the dinosaurs. And this is, he was like three, you know, we knew all the names of the dinosaurs and we just had a lot of fun with that. And we used those dinosaurs everywhere. And, uh, and it, it was, it was a lot of fun, but like knowing what your child loves and then using that to in other ways. Right. So um, and again, in their curriculum, really, it, it is dictated by who that child is and where they are in their journey. Um, it can't be parent or adult driven. It really can't. I mean, they're going to fight you on it and then they're going to lose that love of learning. And then that I mean, that's 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 it's human nature to love learning. Right. I mean, that's why we have storytelling. That's why we have the advancements we have. Otherwise, we would be like every other part of the animal kingdom. Um, so, so and we're not, right? I, I mean, we learn. We learn through a lot of different means. So we love, we love to learn. And we love to share what we've learned. So observe what your child is doing and where they are. And then just follow that. Um, introduce new things. See if they love it. If they don't love it today, they'll love it tomorrow. Have faith in that. Your your child is going to learn. <laughs> I promise. Um, and so, but fighting them, it's futile. Like it's just, it's not going to work for anybody. It's going to be frustrating for you and frustrating for the child. And you're going, you're not going to have that loving relationship uh, around learning. Or it could even not it's not detrimental, but it might hurt the relationship you have with your child as well. There's all, there's plenty of ample opportunities to repair if we're already there. So this is not like, you know, you, there, there's always room to grow, right? Um, 
so there's so that um so observing what fascinates your child and build on that know that at three they're not going to be doing calculus because you know, most likely not going to happen. I'm sure there are some of those uh, savants out there that can do it, and that's and that's that child, right? We we would we would follow that child, um, but we don't by introducing things before they're ready. It just it's confusing and it's frustrating, um, and so just follow your child. Similarly, we all have natural rhythms. Like generally speaking, we wake up with the sun and we go to bed with the sun, right? That's that's evolutionary. There are some people who are more night owl-ish. It's not as common as people want to say it is, uh, but it, it is a thing. And so maybe, you know, your child is more um, inclined to do some of these things at 10 and not 8 a.m. or, you know, whatever. Just Just go with their natural rhythm. That's it. Um, respect them on that. Um, observing rather than interfering. This one's, this one's actually easier for dads and moms, I think. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, moms, um, they want their nurturers in, in this is generalization, right? They're nurturers. And, um, and so they want this is their love language, right? They want to do everything for their children. And dads are kind of like more practical in this, right? That's why we need moms and dads. And um, and dads are kind of like, all right, you know, you do it. Um, so, but, but as the mom, we do need to give the children the space to learn. And so that means we got to let them make mistakes because that's how we learn through mistakes. So, if they put their shoes on the wrong order, fine. They're going to figure it out because it's going to not be very comfortable, right? And you can give them little helps by like cutting stickers in half and putting them um, in the shoes at the sole, right, the heel, um, so they can kind of figure out to match it up. You can give them little little things to help, but let them do it themselves. Let them put on their jacket themselves. They're going to struggle and give them tips, but let them figure it out. It is going to take more time, right? Like you have to, you have to plan your day around. You have somebody who's going to do these tasks slower. They're going to be slower again because their brains are putting in all of that information, right? So it's it's slower. It's a slower process. It's not your child. It's it's development, um, and so you have to give them that time to develop. You need to give them that time to learn and you need to give them that time and opportunity to make these small failures. Now, I say that with one big caveat. If your child is in danger, save your child, right? Like do that. Like don't let them, you know, make the mistake and be unsafe, right? So that's the big caveat. Um, also, I had one child, oh my goodness, Ugh. I had this one child 10, 10 years ago and would stack blocks like this and then unstack them and then stack them. And she would do this for an hour, like sitting still, just stacking and unstacking blocks. blocks. And, um, and we did not interrupt her. We let her do that. And I mean, what a brilliant girl she became, I, truly. And I just remember those days of her stacking those. And I have no idea what she was learning by doing balance. Um, um, who knows? Who knows what they were doing? Who knows what she was, what was processing in her brain when she was stacking and unstacking? But she really, really what a great and bright child that is. Um, so just let them go through it. Like whatever that is, don't interrupt it. Let it happen. Um, and let's see. All right. Allowing for the development of independence. And I talked a little bit about this, about not interfering. 
but we're going to go di di dive deeper into this. So providing opportunity for your child to make choices, that's going to help you actually get out of the door quicker too. Pro tip here, um, instead of having five jackets or five pairs of shoes, have two pairs of shoes, two jackets, that's it. And you give them a choice between this or this. There's a pro there is, and, and this isn't just for children, this is all humans. There is um, a problem that happens when you have too many choices, you can't make a choice. So if you reduce the number of choices, then it's easier to pick. All right, so that's one. Two, children have zero, especially at your youngest age, zero autonomy over their life, zero. They don't get to choose where they live. They don't get to choose how their day goes. They, they get zero autonomy on their life. And a child who wants, who is expressing that they want more independence, will fight you for letting them making choices. And so allowing for that independence and, 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 and promoting that in, independence and supporting and empowering that independence is so important for a child because at the end of the day, at, your child is going to grow up to an adult and you want that child to be secure and confident in themselves. And that happens when they have a sense of independence. And so you need them to start that at a very, very young age to be, to, to be independent. So it'll make your day easier. Like don't frustrate yourself, give them only two options. Um, and, and, and don't frustrate your child by empowering them to make choices. Okay. So encourage them to dress themselves, prepare their own snacks. I've been doing that forever. So pro tip on this one, only have food in your house that you want the child to eat and allow them to make their own choices. So if you don't want them eating Oreos seven times a day, don't have Oreos in your house. You can still have Oreos, but it will be like, oh, let's go to the blah, blah, blah store and we'll get the little two pack and we'll have Oreos, you know, as a little treat because it's a rainy day or whatever, you know, um, and then let them clean up after themselves. They take stuff out. They know where to go, it, go where it goes because you already created the prepared environment. Okay. So let them clean up after themselves. They cannot take something else out until that thing goes back. You can, you can give them tips, right? Like don't make too big of a mess because it's too hard then to see the path forward to clean up, right? There's all of these things that you can do um, to support cleanup. Um, we know exactly where it goes. That's where it belongs. That's it. We're not going to have it in a random spot on the shelf or what have you. There's places for everything and everything is in that place. And then support decision-making process without taking over. So they might decide, you know, mom, dad, I want to blah, 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 fill in the blank. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, I want to wear my sweater when it's 90 degrees out. Okay, that's interesting. Why, why are we doing this? And then they might say, well, because it's my favorite color. I love pink. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, are you concerned about the weather? It's my favorite color. All right. Let them go with that, you know, ask questions and, and see how this goes. Right. You know, well, okay. I think that's a great idea. You love pink. All right. What happens if you get hot? What are you going to do? Right. And so then they might talk about bringing an extra shirt or wearing a shirt underneath so they can take off the sweater. Like, let them figure that out, maybe give them some guiding along the way, but let them figure it out. They're, they're, they're good. Um, providing freedom within limits. You know, uh, I was talking to this, I was talking to this priest once. He, can't, he just came in from the Vatican and he was here in DC. And, uh, and I was asking him for some, uh, for some guidance on, on, uh, on, on the school and, uh, you know, anyways, doesn't matter. And, uh, 
and he had it in his mind that Montessori, we let them do whatever they want. I, I, I don't want to be a part of that. <laughs> and I had to tell him, no, that's not what we do. <laughs> that's something else. That's not us. Um, so no, bright, high, lighter, yellow, like these are your boundaries. Boundaries are extremely important. We, ba- boundaries are extremely, extremely important, right? Especially with girls, um, Girls will, who are people pleasers by nature, the generalization here, I get that, but people pleasers by nature, they won't uh, advocate for their own boundaries, right? So we need to start boundaries at a very, very young age for all children. All children, boundaries are really, really important. And so those boundaries, they, they, they definitely can be personal boundaries, right? Absolutely. They can also be like boundaries for how we conduct our day, boundaries for what we can do in the home, right? Bright highlighter, like don't don't be wishy-washy on that. These are the boundaries and that's it. Like that's it, right? And then, right, if the boundaries don't work anymore because they get older or the circumstances change, then we can talk about at that point, hey, you know what? Like Dad, dad's not working from home anymore. And so we're going to change how we do things, right? So now we can use the den because he's not there anymore, right? Um, so these types of things um, are, are, are things that we can look at when it comes to boundaries, right? And definitely I would make sure that it is very, very clear what your what your personal boundaries are too, right? Like it might be like I I love you, and I I want to show that love to you in whatever makes sense to you, and I I will do that. But here's my boundary: it can't be when I'm in the middle of cooking because I don't think it's safe, right? Or it can't be when I'm in the middle of driving because it's not safe, right? And and that's and that's what it is, right? These are the boundaries. Like I want I want to do all of those things. Like this exciting for me too, right? Like I, I want to, but like here's the boundary, right? So the, these are all um important uh to, to know. But but within those boundaries, they can do a lot of things, right? You can't go in the den, but you can go into the living room, you can go into the kitchen, you can go into your bedroom, yeah, you know, whatever it is, or um you can't, you can't um, bother me when I have hot things in the kitchen, but here's what you can do. You can feed the fish. You can, um, uh, you can, you can cook alongside me. You can, you know, well, I don't know, whatever it is in your house, right? So you can give them a lot of options. So that's the freedom within the boundary. All right. So Here's the next thing. Um, So in closing, Montessori is not just an education method. um, And I would 100% like agree to that one. Um, It is a way, a way of life. um, Because at the end of the day, as parents, we want to make sure our children love to learn. We want to make sure that they're independent. And we want to make sure that there is a, a respect for the world, right? So by embracing these principles, parents help their children develop into, as it says here, confident, curious, and capable individuals. And I wholeheartedly believe that. Um, If you have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the the recording. And um, and then from there, we can um, discuss any questions you might have. Okay. Uh, Thank you.